I'm excited to be talking today with Cameron McMillan, a senior analyst and director of business and professional services for RSM. Cameron has more than a decade of experience serving clients across the country and in 2021 was selected for RSM's Cutting Edge Industry Eminence Program. Today, we'll be discussing a topic that's top of mind to many global leaders, which is the future of work and the workplace uh, as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. What does that look like? So Cameron, I want to start, uh, RSM has 50,000 employees um, all over the U.S., all over the world. Uh, I would love to hear from you. How are you handling the return to work situation um, for your team and also the company wide? What, what are some of the policies that they're putting in place and what's working and what is not? Thanks, Eddie. Happy to be here today. Um, it's kind of a loaded question. Um, as you said, we have we're a very large organization. We have more offices than I can count from um, all over the world and tens of thousands of employees. And what I will say is the very simple answer is we do now have a hybrid work environment. However, we have different teams in different offices that operate a little differently. Um, some teams are better utilized fully in person. Some teams are better u- utilized fully remote. So there are instances where some teams are getting together a little bit more than others. But overall, from a official standpoint, we are 100% real, um, 100% hybrid. And and do you know why the company chose to go with hybrid versus getting everybody back into the office or just allowing everybody to work remotely permanently? Yeah, we sent out countless surveys during the pandemic, really gauging our employees on whether or not they were more comfortable working remote, hybrid or in person. And that was from a health and safety standpoint, um, from an economical standpoint, um, from a standpoint of wanting to spend more and more time with their families, you know, throughout 2020 and 21, a lot more of our employees began to spend more time at home um, with their families and were, work- and were working different types of hours, you know, whether they're working early in the morning, late at night to be able to spend, you know, some of that core time with their family during the day. Some people found that to be, you know, really valuable for them and they, they still continue to work in that method. Some people have gone back to, you know, what we were more pre-pandemic. But what I will say is, our leadership team really took, really stepped out there and asked our employees what it was that they valued and what it was that they wanted to see going forward. And we really moved in that direction. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we're, we're seeing that in our organization as well, coming at the World Trade Center Institute, um, the hybrid approach working while we're, there are certain dates and, and meetings that we expect everybody to be in the office. But given the flexibility where people could, if they feel they're more productive at home, they could be with family, they could save money. Why not uh, embrace that hybrid approach? And it's working out really well for us. Uh, something that we've seen as well, and I would love to ask you this question is, um, do you see consistency um, among people of, of different genders, ethnic backgrounds, age, education, their income levels, positions in terms of their preference on whether they want to work more from home or work more from the office? Honestly, I think it varies across the board. You know, I can't say that I've seen any particular demographic prefer one over the other. I do think that a lot of our employees that have younger families tend to be remote more often than not, because, again, it does give them time to spend time with those younger children. You know, I know myself, I have a four year old and a one year old, and I probably work remote maybe 75 percent of the time because it does give me a lot of time to be able to spend with them. Um, to be able to do family dinners together, to be there for bedtime and things along those lines. And we have that level of flexibility where I can collaborate with my teammates from wherever I am. I think a lot of our employees that do have young families tend to value that. Um, There are others that also value that that don't necessarily have young families. There are some with young families that can't be productive at home, so they are in the office more often than not. I think it really varies across the board. Um, And I think that's really the great thing about having a hybrid work environment and having that level of flexibility is you can do what fits you best. Great answer. Thank you. Um, you, You've you've covered some of this already, but I would love for you to just elaborate a bit on uh, as companies are are planning out their their return to work um, roadmaps, what are some of the questions that senior leadership should be asking 
um, especially now that there is a, a level of uncertainty about the future uh, economic conditions. Uh, COVID continues to be an ongoing challenge. But what, what are some other things that we should all be thinking about as we are making these, these important decisions for the organization? Sure. So I think from an economic standpoint, you know, I live here in Chicago and many folks commute long distances to the office, whether they're coming from the suburbs or different areas around the city. And I think in a lot of major metropolitan cities, they're dealing with some of those same type of commute, those same type of commutes. And I think from an economic standpoint, you have to take into consideration how much are your employees spending to go to and from the office. If you have to drive 30 minutes each way, you have to pay for parking. Maybe that's $20 a day for parking. Maybe that's another $10 a day for gas. You're now spending money on lunch. That's another $15 to $20 on lunch. That can amount to $50 a day, $250 a week, $1,000 a month. Those things begin to add up, right? So, so I think really from an economic standpoint, you probably want to have those types of conversations with your employees also to make sure that that is something that they're interested in. Do they value that in-person interaction enough to be able to take on those additional costs of commuting to and from the office? Yeah, that's a great point. And I think, you know, if, if you if you look at what are the priorities for employees this day, these days, obviously compensation is, is, is important. The opportunity for growth when you're looking at career opportunities. Um, but sometimes this disability to to save and the flexibility of working from home, that's a that's a major in, incentive. And that's top of mind to a lot of people who are considering, should I be working for this company or this other company? Um, so, so, so great point on that. Um, I'd love to hear from you and what's been your experience at RSM in terms of the, what are the technology and IT challenges um, when you have people working in this hybrid uh, approach that you put, that you put in place at RSM? What are, what are some things that people should be aware of when it comes to the technological needs? Yeah, so at RSM, we're a professional services firm. So we are consistently collaborating with our clients virtually as well as with each other internally, virtually. And I myself work with individuals from all over the country and internationally. And so when I think of what technology we need is we need some sort of platform um, like a Microsoft Teams or one of their competitors. I won't go down the line and list, uh, list each platform, but you, you, for one, you need one of those, right? And you need a platform that is going to allow you to be able to see each other virtually so that you can actually build that relationship. You can read body language. You can actually look at individuals in their eyes while you're having a conversation with them. If you're not going to be in person, I think that camera interaction, that on-camera interaction goes a long way as far as building that relationship. So that's number one. And I think from a second piece, um, I'll say some sort of a SharePoint site where you can collaborate on different documents in real time. I myself may have a team of five individuals and we're all working on one specific deliverable to a client. And we can all be in that document at the exact same time, making real time updates. Those type of technologies are really needed when you are in a remote or a hybrid work environment. I'll say um, from a challenges standpoint, I can't say that we faced any real major technology challenges as it relates to going to a more remote environment. Has it, has it changed, Cameron, the way that you communicate with, with one another? I mean, you mentioned uh, having employees all over the world. Maybe pre-COVID you were getting together um, at an annual conference or sometimes they would come to your office, you would go to theirs. And many times the types of conversations, mentorship, which we hear a lot about frequently, right? They happen naturally in uh, in the workplace with uh, so many people working virtually. Have you seen at RSM um, a shift in the way that people are communicating and what are some, some tools and, and lessons learned um, when it comes to communication? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's about being more intentional about your communication. Um, it's about building, scheduling standing calls with individuals on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, a weekly basis. Those people who were in your circle that were in your network, who you just ran into in the office on a, on a regular basis, maybe you all don't necessarily work together, but you run into each other in the office on a regular basis. You are now, you're now not running into those individuals just at the water cooler, 
right? So it's being more intentional of keeping that network by reaching out to them and having still those mentorship conversations or just a social conversation to ensure that you are maintaining that network and you're still building within the organization because you want to make sure you have allies everywhere within your organization. So if you've got that network, when you go remote or you go or you go hybrid, you don't want to lose that network. So it's all about being intentional and making sure that you are reaching out to those individuals and you are staying in contact with them. Um, From a training standpoint, I will say um, that's an ever evolving situation right now. Um, At RSM, we hire quite a few individuals fresh out of school. So you've got a lot of 22, 23 year olds coming in that don't really have experience. So I think we are still working on how we can best train those individuals in their first couple of years so that they can continue to progress in the firm and continue to champion the firm and continue to grow within the firm. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, what, what lessons have you learned from the, the great resignation? Um, you, you mentioned hiring a lot of people. I, I would imagine uh, everyone being a business association and in the international business group, I'm, I'm speaking with a lot of leaders constantly. And it seems that this is, is common across industry sectors that the amount of turnover has just been unprecedented. Um, did you see that at RSM? Or what what have you learned, and and what do you wish you could have done differently? Um, if that's the case <laughs> for RSM, yeah, I think that for in that regard, RSM has been pretty uh, consistent with the overall economy. You know, we've seen a lot of turnover here as well. Um, for one, we know that baby boomers have left the labor force, you know, in droves during the pandemic quicker than we ever imagined. So that has obviously put a strain on a lot of different organizations and a lot of different industries. But then even the younger generations that we're seeing, we are seeing a lot of turnover. And that's because right now everyone's experiencing labor issues. So there's a war on talent. Everyone's trying to poach talent from their different competitors. They're doing that by increasing wages, by increasing benefit. You know, one thing I can say that we've done here at RSM is not only increased wages for our employees, but we have also increased employee benefits. We recently just extended our parental leave from seven weeks to 12 weeks. We've increased um, our adoption fund benefits, our surrogacy fund benefits. Um, So we are consistently trying to provide these types of benefits to our employees so that they understand that we actually value them and we don't want to only throw cash at you, but we can also provide you with tan- with other tangible benefits as you kind of grow, um, as you kind of grow your family. Yeah, uh, you, you you're almost forced to to be creative and come up with unique benefits and ideas to retain your your your, your team. And and you know, at the end of the day, your your team members are just your most important asset. Um, so for us at the World Trade Center Institute, something that we did is we moved to a four day work week and it's been working out perfectly. People feel like they've got more time to be with their family, but they're also more productive. And we did not see um, an impact, a negative impact on productivity at all. So I, I love hearing what other organizations are doing and, and thanks for, for shedding some light on that. Um, I'd love to, to, to shift gears a little bit and just Think, look into the future, right? Um, there's certain things we're using today that three years ago you've never heard of, like Zoom. Um, so, so Cameron, as you as you think about the future of work and the workforce, what are some some trends that you're seeing um, in, in challenges and opportunities that that we may come across in this next year or even the, the following year um, when it comes to the future of, of the workforce? Well. We're going to continue to see uh, some labor challenges here as we move forward, to be quite honest. I think we're I think we're going to get to the point where and I shouldn't say we're going to get to the point where we're already at the point where we're going to we need to see organizations investing more in technology, productivity, enhancing technologies. Those Those technologies are not only going to allow you to replace some of the workforce that you've lost during this time that you may not regain, but it will also help your current employees be more efficient. So, and that goes across all industries. So if you are a manufacturer, you want to be investing in 
technologies or layouts within your plant that are going to make your operators within that plant be more effective and more efficient in producing widget A. Um, that again goes across all different industries. So I can't say it anymore. I can't stress it anymore. Technology, technology, technology. That is what you're going to want to invest in in order to mitigate some of those labor challenges that we're going to continue to see going forward. So that makes perfect uh, perfect sense. Obviously, um, uh, technology is, is is one idea in terms of solving some of this this labor shortage that we're seeing. Um, just a follow up question on that in terms of the, the the new you mentioned having many new hires and, and acquiring talent. Um, ha, has that been? Has the universities been a great partner for you? And in, in, do you feel like? Um, there are institutions out there that are training the next generation of, of, of the workforce um, and, and accounting, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it, it's, it's a, it's an industry and is a position that is in such high demand, right? There are so many people looking for qualified and talent, talented um, accountants. So my question for you is like, how do you go about actual talent acquisition and, um, and, and, and are we as a society and are the universities producing the talent that you need at the pace that you need? So I think the talent's out there. The universities are producing that talent. I think that it has become increasingly more difficult for us from a recruiting standpoint, again, just because everyone is vying for that same pool of talent in a much more aggressive manner than we were a few years ago. So the universities are doing a great job at producing that talent. We are partnering with a number of different universities. We have a number of different programs where we are trying to get students in early on in the process to intern with us, even from even just following their freshman year of college where we can bring them back again their sophomore year for another internship, again their junior year for another internship, and then give them a full-time offer once they come out of school. Those are things that we're working on here at RSM to be able to get in with that talent early on in their college careers so they get a chance to really know who we are as a firm and really build that brand. And hopefully then they're able to stay with us for a while and really grow with the firm. Cameron, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us uh, this afternoon to talk about this important topic that um, so many of us senior leaders and executives are thinking about for our own team. It's been very insightful and refreshing to hear your ideas and RSM's ideas and what's working and what is not. Uh, and again, thank you so much for your partnership, for making the time to meet with us today. And I look forward to connecting with you at a at different um, upcoming program. Thanks, Eddie.